Oh my god, folks, we are in a truly, truly great time. And while it seems that Europa Universalis 5 is still over a year away, at least that is what it feels like to me right now with these dev diaries right here, we are getting a boatload of information and it's all amazing. We have a new Tinto Talks, which are in all but name Europa Universalis 5 dev diaries. And this Tinto Talks dev diary isn't all that long, but there are over three pages of developer responses because Johan went all out. The game director really took the time to sit down and answer all of the questions in the thread itself. Today, I will tell you everything that you need to know about estates and so much more. Now, before we actually hop into this, though, let's take a look at this most beautiful map. We've already seen this in a different map mode in the last week and oh my god, <laughs> look at that. It is 1337, like we have indeed predicted. The first April 1337 indeed. And it's a gorgeous map. Honestly, this looks beautiful. Maybe the, you know, the uh, drop shadow there that comes from the landmass and goes into the sea is a bit strong. It makes it so that, for example, the Aegean Islands are basically just shadows. But in general, I think what we're seeing here is beautiful. I have loved this about Imperator Rome and I will love this in this game. When you take a look at, for example, Epirus and the Byzantine Empire, you can see the actual mountain border. When you look at the Karamanids in southern Anatolia, you will see their exact pathway towards the coastline and the rest is cut off via mountains. You can see the extremely, extremely detailed mountains right here in Georgia that connect them with Trebizond and the Ar Arid needs. I think this is just... It will be a thing of beauty for empire building, for natural expansion, and of course, for your actual army movement gameplay. I'm very much looking forward to exactly how this works. Um, but honestly, yeah, this map... It looks gorgeous. I, I think Imperator Rome to this day, although I much, much prefer Victoria 3's actual, you know, the way these cities are created, the way they expand and so on, but Imperator Rome has such a gorgeous terrain map and... I mean, this looks like it's going to directly step into those footprints. I'm really looking forward to this, but hey, you know what? Let's not stop any further. Let's just hop right into the dev diary. Just as a quick reminder, make sure to subscribe because I will be covering this game until the day it releases. And of course, I also cover other games like CK3 and Victoria 3 here as well. But let's just talk about estates. Estates are one of the core mechanics in the game because they basically depict the stakeholders of your country and later on of your nation. First of all, there will be four estates in Project Caesar, so EU5, which mostly map one-to-one -one with a social class. Nobility, clergy, burghers and the commoners. There's also the crown, which represents the state itself. Each estate will gain power based on the amount of population belonging to the estate. You gotta take note of this because in EO4 we don't have population and there's just this vague number of land owned by the estates and the crown. Here it is directly tied to population, with all the drawbacks and, well, the benefits of it. This will make it a lot less abstract, a lot more tangible, but at the same time might also make it fairly rigid. Think, for example, of other countries where that exactly wasn't true, where, for example, the nobility may have been very numerous but not actually all that powerful. We can, for example, think of administrative empires such as China. Whether that is going to play into the balancing, we will see. Johan did say something about this in the dev comments, so let's talk about this when we get to the end of the video. Now, of course, it is not entirely based on the amount of population belonging to the estate. It is also modified by local attributes of where the population is, where some nobles may have a very high power in certain areas, or whether a specific city has entrenched burger rights there. This is of course cool because it creates local power centers, something that, let's be honest, was basically completely absent in EU4, making it so that the country politics that are going on could be impacted by, well, just generally how you're developing your country going forward, whether you are just urbanizing a particular region and neglecting another, and so on. This right here is the estates part of the government view, where you can see their power, current satisfaction, the equilibrium it's trending toward, and what privileges it currently has. We can see, for example, the nobility has 6% power. They are indeed given five different privileges. I wonder what exactly those are. I can see some stuff about fortifications. I assume land ownership and maybe some re something related to marriages, but I wouldn't exactly know what that is. They are mostly modifiers more than anything. Then we can see they currently are happy with 57.38% and they will go down to 57.36%. At least I assume the smaller number is indeed where it is trending. This leaves us with, well, that relatively smiling face, whereas of course the burgers are not all too happy. The plus button on the bottom right of each estate, I assume, is basically there to add more privileges. This is how it looked in EO4. Honestly, this entire interface 
is not too far away from EO4 at all. Now, let's get down to brass tacks though. What are the actual numbers behind this? Every 1,000 nobles gives plus 50 estate power to their estate, while 1,000 peasants merely give 0.05 estate power as a default. Then these are modified locally in every location as mentioned above and then in the entire country by laws, reforms and most notably the privileges that you have given the estates. The total power of all the four estates and the crown then together all add up to 100%, which is the effective power that they have. Depending on your crown power, you either get a scaling penalty or a scaling bonus. On aspects like the cost of revoking estate privileges, the cost of changing policies in laws, the efficiency of the cabinet, the expected costs of the court and other things. If your crown power is weak, you need to have the estates really satisfied or you will not get much out of any parliament you try to call. Now this entire thing, again, not too different from EU4 where you had to go of course for different bonuses, although parliaments and for example state agendas worked slightly differently than anything described right here. But the idea of course fundamentally being that in EU5 in particular, since it will begin in 1337, we are looking at a very decentralized, very clearly more often than not feudal society, where the bond between the crown and the different estates is on a very interpersonal relationship. And that later will then of course transition into centralization. We can take a look at the Sun King, he's right here as well, Louis XIV and Versailles, where he brought everybody to court. I really like the mention of court right here by the way to keep the estates in line, to keep them basically on a leash, he had them all come to the court, which was tremendously expensive. So maybe early on you don't have that expense, but it goes up as we play, as we stumble into absolutism, and then afterwards, of course, as we become a nation, that relationship should change again. I really like what we're seeing here so far already, but let's continue. Each of the four estates has a current satisfaction and an equilibrium it will move towards. Some estates and some countries will have the estate satisfaction moving quicker to the equilibrium than others. Each estate has two factors per type of estate in which their satisfaction impacts the entire country, where satisfaction above 50% gives a scaling bonus and below a scaling penalty. So you're basically trying to balance that. If the satisfaction is below 25%, this estate will not provide any levies, which is really important if you think about it, especially in the early game, as you might not even have any standing army in 1337. Most importantly, the estate satisfaction also impacts the satisfaction of the pops that belongs to that estate, possibly creating rebel factions or even civil wars. Sadly, no news on how either rebel factions or civil wars will work in this game. I would assume though relatively close to EO4, honestly they're not that bad there. Nobility impacts your prestige gain and your counter espionage. Clergy impacts your research speed and your diplomatic reputation. Burgers impact your merchant power and the production efficiency. Commoner impacts your food production and your stability costs. Everything that we have seen right here is not too surprising. It's basically something that we already know, at least, you know, as general numbers from EO4. Although, of course, commoners impacting food production, I mean, that is amazing to see. Um, it doesn't surprise me here in this context because in Imperator Rome, we already had a really good food system. I think it worked perfectly for that game right there. And if they just built up an evolution of this, so, so for example, let's say in a province or in an area, you are looking at grain stocks, you need to keep them filled. And if they are empty, then this will impact, of course, your population, happiness, your output and your growth. All of which would be very, very interesting to see because then we really get into the weeds of realistic population development. But let's talk about what actually impacts the satisfaction equilibrium of an estate. It's the following things. The privileges they get, the current stability, some reforms may impact them, some laws may, how you tax them and much more. Some examples include clergy being happier with higher religious unity or burghers li uh, liking having more market centers in your country. So far so good. I don't think this sounds too surprising. Now I will say that when it comes to this mechanic, I am curious just how it will differ in different countries. Um, when I think about Victoria 3, for example, interest groups at 1.0, so at launch, very, very often were deeply, deeply similar even in deeply, deeply dissimilar countries. For example, the Chinese clergy would say, I will give you the very same bonus as the clergy in France, which you can do, but definitely does not add to the replayability. We can see right here, and this was confirmed in a dev comment as well, that clergies will give the very same benefits no matter where you play. This is, granted, a much more underlying mechanic than, for example, the advantages and disadvantages that you can get from uh, IG trades in Victoria 3. 
Nonetheless, I hope that everything related to how the parliament plays, how the agendas play, whether they are tribal councils, whether there's like an administrative court, I really hope that the government forms essentially will then add the difference that the estates here clearly don't have as they are similar. I, I just want to bring this up because, well, yes, it will basically be the same. The impact of the estate is the same in every tag, as has been confirmed. I don't really think that this is too much of something to be concerned over just yet entirely, because, well, you can do this on other layers to distinguish different tags, different countries, different estates and how they function. But what exactly that will look like, we don't know yet, of course. Uh, I just want to bring it up because I basically have hawk eyes on the entire issue of replayability and whether will, there will be enough flavor, enough difference between different countries to make it worthwhile to go from EU4 to EU5. I have actually just in uh, the last week played a good chunk of EU4, you know, hopped in there, checked everything out, whether I remembered how to play it, and I did. I formed this truly disgusting Prussia right here uh, on the way of doing that. And EU4, even if it's not my cup of tea, but my god, there's so much going on there. EU5 definitely has to fight a behemoth right here. But let's put that aside and talk about estate privileges in particular. You may feel forced to grant privileges to estates to be able to tax them more, since that will make them less happy. And you may be forced to grant privileges to get their support in Parliament. All privileges impact the power of their estate, and many also increase their satisfaction equilibrium. They all have some impact on gameplay fitting the privilege, and often they also impact a societal value of their country. I really hope that these privileges basically go super super hard on distinguishing just how the uh, estates feel with or without them. We have one example right here, free mobility po uh, for peasants, so that makes them plus 10% happier and if I read this correctly gives them 20% more power. I assume this basically means the power impact right there. Uh, then we have monthly progress to free subjects, so this is one of the government sliders. Then we have allows peasants to migrate, yes, okay, very nice to see, so basically whether your serves are serves or whether they can move freely will of course change the entire makeup and the availability of workforce on, and how much migration actually matters in your country because peasants will be the bulk of your population very very actively. I like that. Here we can see an estate privilege that most certainly will change the makeup of your nation whether you have it active or whether you have it inactive. And then of course last but not least noble estate satisfaction equilibrium minus 10%. I mean, who likes those guys anyway? I find these privileges and this one in particular very interesting. Uh, EO4 privileges, as I was just playing it now, honestly really boring to me. Obviously, you can use it to stack numbers. You can use it to move on and go into a very particular playstyle. But it's just that. It's just numbers. Here we see a de facto impact. An impact like it would, for example, be in Imperator Rome, which again, I really, really adore Imperator Rome's population uh, mechanics there. We'll see how exactly this flows, where exactly this goes. But in general, I think that this is definitely looking good. There are many different privileges and many unique ones depending on where and what type of country you play. This, like I said, seems to be then the layer above the base function of estates where you can slightly change your country, where maybe different playstyles, different replayability and so on comes into play. They've also mentioned taxes before and while this is not the development diary where we go into details about the economic system, it is important to mention that these states of a country have wealth that is increased by the amount of money that you have not taken from them in taxes. Richer states will use their wealth on many things, primarily to invest into things that benefit them, but will often also build things that also benefit the country. Oh my god. In one fell swoop, they have mentioned that there is essentially private investment in the form of estates investing in your country. I love that. This is the first thing, except for the pops and the map being amazing. Okay, you know what? There are many other things where I'm like, U5 looks great. But this right here looks truly, truly great because all of a sudden the estates different from EU4 are very proactive actors that are trying to push something in their favor and at the same time might lead to a benefit for your country as well. Honestly, this dev diary is very, very exciting for me. Fundamentally, I have the question of replayability here definitely attached, but what I am seeing is much more than what was of course available in EU4 when it comes to estate interaction and so on. Now next week, before we go into the developer comments here, who next week is an interesting topic. They will be talking about proximity, control and maritime presence. All concepts that need to be talked about in detail. I very much agree. I want to build a world spanning Spanish empire and it has never felt that way other than my troops needing to move somewhere or my colonists needing to arrive somewhere over a certain time. There was nothing really that made me feel that the backwaters in America that I utilized entirely to exploit the location right there to bring wealth back to Spain, 
that that really was a backwater, that I really had to control the seas to actually make it there. But now with proximity, control and maritime presence, I hope that we're going to get a real feeling, both in how we build our nation first as a feudal decentralized state, so we're centralizing it, which means control increases, and then how we build overseas empire with proximity and maritime presence. I really, really hope that we get a layered experience right here because that would be amazing. I'm really hyped for next week's Dev Diary. But that was it for this Dev Diary. We're going to now jump into the Dev Responses because there were plenty of them, like I said. If you have any thoughts on the Dev Diary so far, then definitely let me know in the comments. And let's take a look at what Johan has to say. Johan first of all confirms that indeed stuff like the Bosporus, the Dardanelles and the Danish Bells will have specific mechanics attached to them. I hope that we can both have tolls, that we can stop people from passing through and that maybe I can even control it if I am indeed not Denmark just because I have my navy right there. All those things would be welcome but just in general, we already know that there's definitely something coming for that. Then, a user named Hearts of Iron 3 Addict said, Can estates force through law changes and reforms if they are dissatisfied and powerful enough, even if you don't call a parliament? And the answer is there are ways for that. Which yet again is great news, because the more active the estates are, the more exciting will domestic gameplay be. And I thought about this as well, right? If we start in 30, 30, uh, 1337, if you ever played EU4, or any EU game for that matter, uh, then you will know that 100 years in, the map will look nothing like its historical counterparts. To stop me from blobbing in 1337 and unify Germany by 1500, you gotta give me some other stuff, right? You give me some, uh, some meat lying around that I can play with. My hope here is indeed that the estates will make it so that we will have to cleanse our internal politics before we can do much when it comes to external uh, power grabs. This right here, if you can't control the estates, they will just simply pass laws that might be really laws that you don't want, is something that I find interesting. I do wonder as well how much inspiration they might be taking from the uh, actual, you know, the Senate mechanics around Imperator Rome and the laws around Imperator Rome in the actual, you know, how do you pass these laws, that kind of stuff. Uh, we're going to see how that goes. Of course, we don't have more information on that yet. Somebody also brought up that indeed estates work in a very similar fashion in Mayo and Texas. So M-E-I-O-U, one of the biggest and best mods without a doubt for Europe Universalis 4. Although I wish the interface was better, but it's EU4. It's on the Clausewitz layer of the engine, not the Jomini layer. So they have a much harder time doing UI. I get it. Anyway, that mod is great. And obviously this, yeah, seems very similar in many ways, even in population, for example. Johan says, ironically, I've never really played this mod beyond testing it. I do have employees from the mod and I really enjoy talking with Gigao and his friends at every PDX con. So basically, just a coincidence, but I assume that, well, yeah, if you want to go into a more simulationist direction, what Mayo and Texas are doing already fits it pretty well. In two responses, Johan then later also talks about the topic of achievements and Iron Man mode. And well, in newer games, Iron Man is no longer required for achievements. He says that if it were his decision alone, achievements should always require Iron Man. Ask later whether that means that they will require Iron Man, he says, this is why I said if it were my decision alone. I would take this as a loose confirmation that we are very likely to be able to get achievements even without Iron Man in EU5, which I personally like. Um, listen, if you're gonna cheat for that stuff, you can do that anyway. I like to get achievements because it's a fun playthrough, but yeah, so basically that seems to be the new policy going forward there here in EU5 as well. And here we come back to the question, by the way, when it comes to, hey, how do you make it so that different countries play differently? Like I said, the estates are the same everywhere. However, the tool sets are not. Will the demands, bonuses and equilibrium of the different estates depend on the state's culture, government or tag? Those impacts the tool you can use. However, there is no, you play Scotland, so your nobles have minus 10 satisfaction. You will shape the tag that you have and what your culture, your government and so on is will impact how you can do it. But yeah, everybody starts with the very same base mechanic. It is also confirmed that they will be going around the map to set up historical privileges in a way that does not cause an instant civil war, but still creates a bit of a difference between the different tags when you start out the game. Now, here is a very, very interesting piece of input. Johan was asked, if one of the states get disloyal and rebel, will they be represented as rebels like in EO4? And if so, will they become own separate nations when they enforce the demands like with Cossack states or how does that aspect work? And Johan says it is rather different. Closest is the civil war mechanic in Imperator. 
which, wow, I mean, um, Imperata had a very, very different approach there for sure. I honestly am not sure whether I like the idea of the tag always splitting. I know that this has been the tendency, Vicky does it, Hearts of Iron 4 does it, and so on, but there is just something more raw to just re a rebel spawning. Now, at the same time, of course, they become trivial, they've never been impactful, so I understand this, but... Yes, Civil Wars and Imperator were, were, I mean, massive, massive deals. The way you had to fight them out was uh, quite intense, I would say, and sometimes it could be quite intense over nothing much. We'll see how it works right here. Um, I assume that, you know, for example, states have to band together, that kind of stuff. We'll see exactly how it goes. It's an interesting deviation from EU4 nonetheless. Oh, and here we have another interesting one. Does it really make sense to have a state power based on population? A province having five noble families instead of one noble family doesn't make the nobility in that province five times more powerful. Powerful. In fact, the nobility would probably be weaker if it split among multiple smaller houses instead of a single noble house controlling all the land. Nor does a noble family become twice as powerful if they have 10 family members instead of 5. Johan says this is one of the abstractions we were willing to make. Now, I am somewhat. This is like, I think, the biggest part of this dev diary that I'm skeptical about. I am somewhat skeptical about this because the implication is that unless you drastically change the population setup of your country, yeah, you will just have very baseline aristocracy power distributions that will apply to every country. Maybe population ultimately does not actually make that big a part of, you know, the entire power of the estate. We will see whether that limits just what you can do about your estates. We will see how important the privileges will actually be in changing things here. But yeah, the implication seems to be if you have two nobles, then indeed you get very little noble power. If they balance this right, this can work, but this definitely seems like one of the, you know, basically uh, pitfalls that you can potentially get if you are very simulationist about things. <coughs> Victoria 3. There's a lot of pitfalls just based on everything being extremely simulationist. Now, EU5 doesn't go that far, but yeah, stumbling into that over a four, 500 year period like in this game would be quite disastrous. Let's hope that they figured that out. He also confirms here, by the way, that the map is detailed enough for Andorra to be present, which, wow, okay, that is amazing. I wonder what the Holy Roman Empire looks like. That has to be a total disaster. There's just no way around that. I'm very excited to, you know, kind of tear through that, especially towards the end of the game in the period of revolutions and to kind of consolidate that to get the church out of all those locations. Johan also confirms that levies will indeed be your prime foes until the mid to late game, which is amazing. In Imperator Rome, you can get legions relatively quickly, but of course also rely on your levies primarily at, at the very least at the start. Uh, now, I will be very happy to say that I really like this approach, you know, transitioning into these different periods when you start with levies and then you move towards standing armies. You may basically formalize everything, have a much more sophisticated army tradition. Again, much like everything existed like this already in Imperator Rome and when it comes to army tradition and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff already exists in EO4 as well. But making it so that this phase lasts for longer until you actually move into standing armies, I love it. Chef's kiss. I, I think that is a great piece of work right there. And now here we have one of my favorite Johan responses, and it's this one. How will the new pop and estate system model the Reformation? Will there be separate denominations? If so, might we see proto-Protestants, for example, Waldensians and the Lollards, represented among populations in the 1337 start date? To add to this question, would it be possible for a scenario in which the Lollards or the Waldensians come to prominence during the Reformation, instead of being subsumed into later movements? Reformation is a longer process and involves many more options along the centuries, from Lollards and Hussites to Lutherans and Calvinists. I love this idea. There is critical mass going to be reached in the Catholic Church. Who reaches it, when they're reaching it, why they're reaching it, where they're reaching it, all those questions should be variable. All those questions should depend on, is your population happy? Are you in a good state? Do you have high religious unity? Are holy wars, for example, let's say, the Teutons, right? Uh, everything going on to the last crusades that you might want to send towards the Valdensians and so on. Are those actually going to be successful or not? I love the concept of this actually being so deeply rooted in the simulation and in particular what is going on in the world. I would even go so far, and I don't think that this is going to be in, that I would love it if other countries, other religions could also see very similar states, right? Obviously, the Reformation is the big, big process right here in the Christian world, but I really like the idea of religions in general being a bit more fluid. Whether that is going to be the case, let's be real here, I doubt it. I assume that this is basically Reformation-based content, but 
yeah, I'm very happy to see that this is handled this way rather than with a uh, boop, reformation begins. They already don't do it this way in EU4, but going harder on this, something that I absolutely adore. Johan also confirms right here that estates will be very moddable, which is of course very welcome to see for sure. That means if you have a mod that, for example, let's say is set in the world of Anbana, you could screw around a lot with different variations, different options, different pop types and so on. We are also getting a very wake statement towards personal unions. They will be working differently. What exactly that means? Who the hell knows? Folks, I will leave you right here and I'll see you later, alligator.